All right, we're ready to get started again. One of the one of the things I did want to bring up as far as the um, the managed dove fields, if we do pass this, along with Commissioner uh, Mitrick's concerns, I, I would like to see to make sure that all the regions on one of their game lands or on some of their game lands, we would do some managed dove field programs so that people wouldn't have to pay um, to hunt doves and we would have public access for all small game hunters that wanted to hunt doves. So pick out those spots on your game lands so we can get those taken care of. Um, and I know that's not something that might be done right away, but we want to work toward that goal. Well, I think in the southeast region, I think they've already been uh, utilizing some habitat management for doves. Um, and I didn't get, personally get a chance, to, uh, the opportunity to hunt over it, but what I've understood is that it's, it's pretty hectic out there. For a day of dove season. There's there's opportunities too to negotiate yeah. more with our sharecroppers that are already out there working the land to get some of these at very little cost to the agency. Sure. In addition, there's other techniques used in dove field management and managing the native vegetation, just disturbing the ground. So there's a number of things that could be done at very low cost to the agency. Okay. Just so we have opportunities for hunters to hunt on, on public ground. If you do that on, on game land, you save some of the blowback. So sure. as far as the idea that we're it's not all just baiting. Yeah, and, and as was brought up um, while we were on break, we would have uh, a better capabilities of regulating what goes on in those dove fields. So, all right, so we're on to the administrative division. Uh, Commissioner Daly, I think this is this is your yeah. committee, well, and um, some of these are your concerns. So, you want to give us a little bit of a briefing before we get started? Well, the reason I asked Doc to come here, of course, we did replace the uh, license system. Some of the things we've had issues with that we couldn't do, like issuing different numbers of tags for different critters and whatever, all came out of PALS and the way it was being operated. And, and so I think Doc can tell us a lot about those capabilities. And the other one that really concerned me, though, is, you know, historically we've gotten matching funds from the feds based on number of license sales. And a license sale really had to bring in a net of one dollar before they counted that as a sale that they would refund us money for. Well, they're talking about raising that. Now, we need to somehow either oppose that or make sure our licenses bring in enough net revenue to get counted as we go <coughs> forward. And that's what I want to talk to inform us about what that change is, how much is it, how would we deal with that issue. Okay, very good. Doc, when you're ready. There were so many exciting topics that we wanted to, that we thought about, but <laughs> these rose to the top. Um, yes, I just wanted to uh, give you an update on, on some uh, significant changes to the Code of Federal Regulations that will have a fiscal impact on us, um, on our funding, federal funding levels going forward. So I just, uh, I'll just give you a brief overview of what that's about. As you know, you know we receive uh, uh, funding from PR funding from uh, the Wildlife Sports Fish Restoration Program, and overall, uh, there is about 1.1 billion dollars annually that is distributed to the state's fish and wildlife agencies. Um, our portion of this comes from the Pittman-Robertson, which was enacted back in 1937. Um, of that, of that amount. Um, there's over $780 million that was distributed in license year 1617 um, across the United States. Pennsylvania's share of that is, was 27.9 million, 27 .9 million. It's on, we are the third highest um, state that has allocated PR funding only behind Texas and Alaska. The apportionment formula um, for the PR funding is 50% paid license holders, uh, base license holders, and 50% land across the state. And 
and um, there's minimum and maximum amounts of this apportionment that each state can receive. No state may receive more than 5% of the total annual apportionment, and each state must receive at least one half of 1%. A certified hunter is basically the requirements to be counted as a certified hunter are basically a base license um, to hunt in Pennsylvania and the license must produce a certain net amount of revenue coming back into the agency. And there you'll see it's maybe a bit difficult to read there but it's the actual current rule and then the proposed rule. In this case, we're talking about the net amount of revenue coming back into the agency. Currently, if, if the state receives $1 in net revenues, you can count that hunter um, in, in your certification. The proposed rulemaking is now to change that net revenue. The state must receive a total of $2 a year for each license that is valid. What does this mean for us? Well, currently we have over 10 different licenses and I'll show you those in a few minutes uh, that basically um, it will be affected by this. Currently, some of our licenses that, are, that we charge $2.90, a dollar for the license, a dollar for the issuing fee, issuing agent fee, and then 90 cents, cents for our transaction fee, our licensing transaction fee. We still receive a dollar coming back into the agency, and so therefore that we are able to count them in our certification. Under the new proposed rulemaking, um, the two dollars you, you'll see that those licenses, two dollars and ninety cents, a dollar issue, a dollar issuing agent, and um, we're short in. We still have the ninety cents transaction fee, and we're short, um, and. Therefore, cannot count those um, those uh, licenses that are sold for two dollars and ninety cents. The next way in which the revenues affect us um, are the multi-year licenses or our senior licenses. Um, and again, they're saying that uh, we must receive two dollars in net revenues per year. So when we look at this, we're looking at our residential senior lifetime licenses, renewals, and right now the $51.90 dollar issuing agent, 90 cents transaction fee is $50. We can count those individuals as long as they have obtained a, renew a renewal um, for 50 years. Under the proposed rulemaking, they changed, it changed so that um, our net revenue coming in is is only a dollar and therefore we excuse me is fifty dollars and therefore we can only count those individuals for 25 years as opposed to the 50 years now we'll look at the license that are affected and this may be a, a bit difficult to read up there but I'll go through some of it. It's the residential military license, the residential National Guard licenses, uh, the residential reserve, the POW, the reduced um, DV licenses, the mentored youth permit, the mentored youth no permit, and the um, reduced DV fur taker license. Those are the single year licenses. The lifetime licenses that will be affected are the residential senior lifetime hunting and the residential senior lifetime combo that are, that are affected. Um, the total for 16-17 hunting season, these licenses were a total of 37,290 licenses that, that were, will be affected. And when we look at the fiscal impact of that, we're looking at um, we, each license, each, each certified um, hunter, we can equate about $37 um, that we receive in federal funds from every certified, from every license buyer that we can count. Um, the 
of the 37, as we go back and we looked at the, uh, how we come up with the formula, the, the state land is not gonna change. However, the certified hunters are gonna change. So instead of receiving um, the $18, it's approximately $18.62, we should plan on um, losing because of not being able to count those um, 37,000 licenses. Now going forward, this only means that we're going to have more. Um, with the lifetime licenses, um, right now we have, uh, we have 1,066 licensed buyers that are over 90, or excuse me, 89 years old. That, that number is only gonna grow. And unfortunately, I don't have the, um, I don't have a total right now of, of these, except to say that it's probably between about 550 to 650 um, um, individuals that will be added to that 1,066 each year. So, do we have any questions? What's a big impact? I mean, if you look at seven hundred thousand um, dollars, and so you know what? I guess what can we do about it? So, a we could charge a little bit more for the ones that are permits that we would issue, or proposed permits, like we're talking about for junior pheasants, right? We could have an active, or at least come up with a letter from the commission to whoever, whichever agency is doing this. Is this Fish and Wildlife that's proposing these CFR regulations? Um, it is, and actually it's been in the working for about two years now. It has gone to different committees, different um, regional meetings when the regions would get together and which en encompass about 13 to 15 states per region. And they have been working on this for several years. So it's at the very last stage. And as a matter of fact, um, they expect this to be fully approved um, in that this June will be the first year in which we will, it will affect us in our certification. This is actual licensed buyers, not permit. Not That's permit correct. Buyers. So it doesn't, the pheasant permit thing really doesn't affect anything, yeah. but it is the junior, it is the, is the mentored youth license, for instance, uh, can be affected, <coughs> where we can start to count some of those. That could be an issue for us as well. Any any base license sold? Well, and there's isn't there current legislation for some reductions in licenses for volunteers and veterans and right. that, that will affect us in the long run. So that might be an issue that we need to talk to the legislature and let them know. You know, we're all for what they want to do as long as yep. we can get that funding from. Well, we may be all for what they do. Well, it's I, still a loss of revenue. Either way, yeah. it's a loss of revenue. Yeah, it's a loss of revenue. But we don't want to. We don't want to be a, a double whammy if we can avoid that. We want to stay above the two dollars that right. we need to to bring in. Is right. I mean, two dollars isn't going to break anybody's bank. I don't think. Right. Right. And I don't know if it's too late to comment on. I don't know what stage these uh, proposed federal regulations are in. I mean, we could certainly. I would think, as an agency, have some ability to hopefully. At least have respond to what's had no response from the agency no. on any of that. No. We we've had, yeah. Yeah. We, had we, we responded in writing as well as um, we had several conference calls that we held with other states in our region five and uh, put together a, a, a regional response from all the states. But I, I just don't think it's going to have much of an effect. So, what's the What's the object? What's the reasoning behind yeah, what they're doing? Um, they're, they're basically just trying to simplify things. <laughs> oh, one versus two. <laughs> simplify yeah. things. How does that simplify? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm well, you know lost. why? Because somebody was sitting behind her desk and goes, I've got a great idea. <laughs> we can edit that, right? <laughs> <laughs> to the second one. Well, wait, 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 that's just for a sec. Because, I mean, uh, Jim's brought up some, some good points and concerns. Do we have, do we have an idea of, of, or a game plan that we can move forward and try to buffer 
some of these losses. Yeah, I thought you might want to say we did briefly meet, well, not briefly, quite some time meet with Bureau of Wildlife Protection and others to look at you know some of these bills that are coming through and how we could offset these. Um, when it comes to, and at the same time, could we simplify things? That's mm -hmm. the challenge. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't come up with a solution as of yet. Yeah, we're, we're just really brainstorming about it right now and okay. trying to work with uh, the Region 5 and, and see what they can do for us um, in light of this loss. Possibly looking at other opportunities to um, eligible programs, you know. Okay. So these are license fees that we can't raise to meet that requirement then? That's correct. That's right. I mean, does the legislature know that? something else so it's kind of funny in a two dollar and ninety cent license we're only showing that we get a dollar of it the rest is going to the issuing agent and to the whoever the, the transaction fees and all this other stuff is there any way we can bargain with whoever is getting these issuing fees and transaction fees that they don't get them on the two dollar and ninety cent licenses if they didn't we still get it you just made Gas. <laughs> I don't care. I mean, you know, we're not talking a huge number of licenses right. they wouldn't get them on. Right. You know, we're getting, uh, if you look at it up there, it was an 18 for one. When we had, when it was a dollar, we were getting 18. Right. Right? I mean, so if we could bargain with those people and say, you're not getting it on those. You can raise it to a dollar and a quarter on these other ones. I don't care. Okay, so the, the, the problem that you have is that you still have issuing agents that are paying somebody to sit there and I just the said we could increase those to a buck and a quarter if they want, or whatever, to offset the ones that they can't. We can't increase anything, though. I don't know who. I don't think the legislature puts the issuing fee in, do they? I, I think they do. You sure? Yeah. We negotiate the transaction fee, but I think the issuing agent fee is set by the legislature. So if we were getting rid of the transaction fees, enough to keep us whole on those two dollar ninety cent licenses, and we still ten cents short. But why would they, why would the issuing a, why would the transaction fee or the company that handles that be willing to give you free licenses because there is a cost involved with printing every one of those licenses? Well, we could bump up the other ones. I'm just saying we want to keep these ones in our account. <laughs> one of the things that um, we have negotiated with Region 5, and that is like right now that 90 cents transaction fee, because that actually does come back into the agency. Um, and then we pay that out under a separate contract, right. we can acknowledge that and receive that. That can be counted as part of our net revenue. Um, what can't be counted is the issuing agent fee because the issuing agent fee, that money never is transferred to the agency. It's kept by the issuing agent. So we can't recognize that dollar. Um, of course, if you, if you would say, okay, the issuing agent fee comes back into the agency and then we'll pay you after the fact, we can acknowledge that. But that's a tremendous amount of work. Probably lose money on that yeah. deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, is there any way to just get this information to the legislature, try to get a bill passed quickly? I, I, I can't imagine, maybe, <laughs> I shouldn't say can't imagine, but it just seems to me that if we presented this in a very logical fashion, that perhaps they'd cut us a break on just these few licenses so that we could get those fees increased before all this takes place. I think they don't like to take action until something is actually passed at the federal level. If once it passes, I think we would have a better chance of approaching the legislature, but to do it on something that's pending, they're hesitant generally to take action. In addition to that, you, you want to look at the licenses. It's all military, it's youth, it's seniors, you know. Are those the ones that we want to increase? <laughs> By a dollar, yes. yes. You know, a is the logical a answer. Cup of coffee oh, costs a buck seventy-five bucks. now, <laughs> unless you go to some other place. <laughs> it is five dollars a cup. I don't know if a dollar is going to break anybody. Okay. Well, I think we could at least make them aware of it now, so that they can mull it over. You know. That's your testimony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
speakers. Yeah. So heads up. Put something in there. Any other questions for Don about the, the funding issues? All right. I guess now you're going to talk about the replacement of the licensing system? Yes, I, I just want to um, put this caveat on it, though. Right now, we're, we're right in the, uh, we're about two months into working with our new licensing vendor. As a matter of fact, this week they're here on site. Um, they'll be working with us, both us and the Fish and Boat Commission. Um, a lot of these things that I'm going to talk about today are, were part of our requirements in the requirement document for the uh, system that we would like to have going forward. Um, of course, n n things have not been built yet, and so some things may change. But So I'll just be a little gray about some of the uh, enhancements of the of the system, but we won't know until we have it. Um, but I can share with you what we would like to see going forward with the replacement of our PALS. Uh-oh. Madrid, you're out. You're out. <laughs> Your time is up. This is still pals. Yes. Oh, I thought the pals was the company. Oh, that's no, our name. No, no, no. Okay. So um, after a very long process, an RFP process, it took almost a, uh, over a year. Uh, we've selected a new vendor, their Sovereign Sportsman Solutions, or S3. They're based out of Nashville, Tennessee, and um, we just awarded them a 10-year contract. The contract was signed February 8th, I believe. Um, February 8th. It was fully executed. And so the uh, contract will go until February 2028. Um, some of the, some of the uh, benefits that we will see will affect the hunters and trappers. Improvements will be seen by issuing agents. PGC and our stakeholders, as well as the general public. Um, how will we see these benefits? Well, the hunter and trappers, you'll see some security enhancements with the internet log on. Some, is some security safety uh, features we, we put into the system was that um, just like any other account that you would go into, you would build your own account. You wouldn't have to put your CID and your birth date. Uh, this will allow um, folks that may get a hold of someone's CID number and, and know their birth date and access their personal information. Um, we're building it a bit differently so that you will go on, on to your own account, have your own password, and have access to your information. Um, we are increasing the pur purchase opportunities in that a lot of our um, licenses and Permits that are on the outdoor shop will now be available through the PAL system as well. Um, we have a feature in the new in the new system um, called an event notification. This will allow us to get message, messages out to the hunters and the trappers um, and just make them aware of things that are going on, events that may occur, deadlines that we may have. We'll have the opportunity for for um, mobile ap applications. And one of the biggest features, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about, is the harvest reporting. Um, the harvest reporting, we, we plan on having that built into the PAL system so that at every issuing agent site, you will be able to go back to that issuing agent and do your harvest reporting in the system. Um, I don't know how this is going to work. I suspect that we'll have to do some negotiating with the issuing agents in that they may want to be compensated. Um, so I'm not quite sure how we're going to handle that. Why would we have them go back to the issuing, issuing agent? What is the possibility? Well, one of the, the features, one of the opportunities that we will have here is that if we can get this totally automated, 
um, we can at some point eliminate the mailing cards. All right. So, so the harvest reporting could be done through the PAL system on the computer instead of going to the thing over there. Oh, yes, of course. It's just one possibility for, let's say, the Amishman that, right, that right. doesn't have access to a computer. Right. He could go back and bought the it's, license. This is right. just told. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, as it stands now, they can also call in. So those people don't even have access to, to a phone. That's a then? very cumbersome, um, uh, the, the IV and IVR, I think it's called. It's very cumbersome. And it's difficult for hunters. They, they become very frustrated because when they're inputting the tag number, which is a 15 digit number, they're getting, they're having a hard time. As well as um, the municipalities and townships and so forth that are requested um, through the harvest reporting process. It's very difficult when you have people with uh, different accents, how they pronunciate their townships. Um, it's, it's, it errors out so, quite a bit. So we're eliminating that, is that what you're saying? Yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna be straight online then? Straight online, or you can go back to an issuing agent and let them input your information. But it's all tied to this system now. It's not gonna be tied through the outdoor store. Or That's correct. It's tied to this system. Now, does that then give us the capability to initiate uh, limits on doe uh, tag purchases or doe, doe it, permit purchases? It will, it will. It, now, that, that we haven't, uh, of course, you know, when we build this or when they build it, uh, we may have to make some compromises on that. However, uh, the situate we did talk about having that ability so that if somebody wants to come in and get another doe tag we can see that they have reported their harvest already in the system which allows them to purchase another one yeah that would be my thing i, I mean again in the most of the state we don't deal with that but in the southeast region in the special regulations area where we've got guys purchasing 30 tags mm -hmm. i think one guy purchased 58 tags so I think there's that caveat that gives us the ability now to say you can have five and then when you report more then we can literally go to an unlimited number of tags because we're, we're really focusing our usage then on the people that are taking the, actually harvesting the deer in the areas that are needed uh, without limiting them on, the, on their abilities to do so. As long as we have the system built to do that, I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Um, currently, the hunter trapper education verification is not in the PAL system. We will be tying that into the PAL system as well. Um, <coughs> so that's definitely going to be a bonus. Uh, the issuing agents. The issuing agents, we will be eliminating the Verifones. Uh, this will be a completely web-based system, and we won't have the uh, antiquated Verifones uh, that, that you see now. A lot of problems came with the Verifones, so it was our decision to get rid of them. Um, we'll have some, uh, of course, upgraded, improved equipment. The printers and the pin pads will be more modern. Um, we'll have new equipment. We'll have the ability to do scan, to issue scanners to all the issuing agents so that they can scan, whether it be the barcode or a QR code um, that will provide information. Um, Again, we're having enhancements to the functionality of the system, which will enable um, the issuing agents to do more, uh, more drop downs, more sophistication. Um, we have flexibility right now. If we have any kind of issue with, uh, with uh, and what our, our sweeps, when we're sweeping the issuing agent, um, they have so much time that they have to confirm that they are in agreement with what we plan on sweeping. Uh, from their bank accounts and um, we'll be able, if, if for some reason there's an issue or there's a problem, uh, the next time we have to wait a week in order to sweep them. Here we will have a flexibility in that we could sweep an issuing agent on any given day. Um, again, we're gonna have targeted messaging so that we can put uh, messages in the system, maybe only for the county treasurers, maybe only for this particular region of the state that we want to issue to all the issuing agents in the, in a particular area. Uh, we'll, we'll have the ability to do that. 
and again, you know, with more more sales opportunity for the issuing agent, if the if we decide that um, you know they want to take advantage of the harvest reporting, people will coming back into their stores. Um, that's just more foot traffic. Um, as far as um, how it will benefit the us and and our stakeholders. Um, there'll be, we'll have uh, merchandise, more merchandise available on the, on the, uh, on the PAL system. Uh, currently, we don't have merchandise in the PAL system. We will have the ability to do that. Um, we will be able to load privileges and, and, and um, add vendors, issuing agents, um, to our system. Right now, um, in the current system, every time we want to change, every time we want to add a privilege, it has to go through a change management process and, and uh, it, it may take months to make a change in the system. We will have the control over that here in um, licensing division. Um, we'll have uh, easier reporting functionality, more reporting functionalities. Um, again, we will be able to load in any kind of event notifications that we want to get out there. Um, our control center um, is going to be similar to like a dashboard and we'll have more opportunities and more functionality within the system to <coughs> immediately um, create graphs, charts, reports. Um, and again, you know, with this harvest reporting, that's going to be huge for us. It's going to allow us to do so much more if we want to do it as far as uh, um, uh, you you must report your harvest. Um, I'm trying to think of the word here. I'm missing it. Um, it's not optional. And then if, if we want to do something in the system where that if you didn't report your harvest, you can't buy a license next year, you know, for any particular privilege. We'll have that ability as well. And then just um, just more sophisticated functionality within the system. But that's still an additional cost, is that correct? The harvest reporting? Yes. No. We negotiated that so that was part of the transaction fee. The only additional cost that we may have would be if um, we have to compensate the issuing agents for accepting harvest reportings from the hunters. Are we capturing phone, uh, emails and phone numbers with this system? We are. Yes, we are. And then as far as the general public, the general public will also see uh, some things, will have some abilities. We've also negotiated um, uh, video and media opportunities. Um, this, um, S3 has a sister agent or a sister company that's uh, Sovereign Sportsman's Network. And they do their award-winning TV show. Um, they have done many clips on YouTube. Um, and I, if, if you, um, that website that I have up there, if you just click on that, you'll see some of the things that they've been doing across the country. It's just, it's just amazing. Um, we'll have more outreach, um, our three opportunities. You know, it's, it's great to collect all this data and, and, but then what do you do with it? You know, everybody talks about our three, but what do you do with the data that you are collecting and, and all this data mining that you're doing? And um, they have some really great ideas. We're very anxious to uh, get with them and, and see some of the ideas. They're, gonna, they're willing to share with us things that they've done in other states. So we're pretty excited about it. And then, of course, the marketing opportunities. Um, they will have they have marketing opportunities um, that they, again, they will share with us. Uh, they even will bring an on-site assistance, assistance uh, to the agencies um, if we need them to work with our existing marketing staff. So we're pretty excited about that. And our projected date to go live is going to be between February and March of 2019. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of wiggle room um, to do that. You know, that seems to be the perfect time for both the Game Commission and the Fish and Boat Commission. And so our window is, is very small. So it's very important that we stay on track and, and keep this a very high priority in the agency for the, for the next year.
So I assume that since we're still tied into fish and boat, there, there's no um, there's no leeway for color changes and licenses and. Um, well, we can we can probably change it. I don't know what what it's going to be like going forward. Obviously, you know, we can get rid of the yellow, but we may be stuck with if we choose green. We may be stuck with green for a while. Yeah, um, yeah that's difficult to say because. The paper or the stock is very expensive, and so you want to be careful about changing it. If we change it uh, more often, well, we've never changed it, but um, we'll be changing licenses in the middle of a year, whether it be for us or for fish. Yeah, again, and that's so, why we're yeah. kind of tied together. So, mm -hmm. just I was just curious. Something other than yellow, maybe. Yeah. Well, you get Chartreuse. to pick the color. <laughs> Think. Okay, that's all I have. Any questions? So I have one. Okay. So back at February 26th, we had our our meeting with the Auditor General's people. Yes. And the audit has been going. Any updates? Where we're at? Well, how's it going? Any issues? Um, n no, not so far. Um, the since that time, they had made a, uh, several requests. All have been satisfied. We've provided them within that time frame. They're giving us like three days to get the information back to us. We have met all their, uh, all their deadlines. Um, there was a, a, a significant amount of information that they were asking for. They also had interviewed two individuals. Um, I think that what they were looking for there is just like how, how we operate. You know, they talked to, uh, uh, our, our budget uh, chief of financial management, Dan Dunlap, and he provided them with overview of just how the workflow is, um, how we do things around here from a financial perspective. And then they talked with uh, uh, the division chief for the real estate division um, down in wildlife habitat management, Dennis Knighting, and he again provided them with all the information that, that they needed as far as uh, how things work you know, how we do our business. Um, they've also requested uh, uh, three years worth of game news. I don't know if they just wanted to read it or, <laughs> you know, I'm not quite sure, but, um, uh, so they're just starting to do their um, investigating on, on how we operate. They, um, but that's about, that's about all. Okay, Yeah. very good. You have a team of people that you've put together that or helping get information out Absolutely. to them. Yeah. So a big thanks to them for getting that out sure. on time so mm -hmm. that we can get this process done as quickly as possible and satisfy everybody's curiosity. Absolutely, that's our goal. Thanks, Dot. I also okay. want to compliment Dot because not many people realize how many balls she juggles at one time, and it's a lot. It's a tremendous amount of workload she's taking on, so thank you, Dot. She could. <laughs> 28 <laughs> balls at the same time in the air for her. I don't want it. I don't want to get it out and then ruin it. I know I was supposed to hit that little arrow. Down That's okay. Yeah, we, we got it. it. We already got it out. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Thank you. I can do that. <laughs> um, actually, it's, I, I probably should have um, brought it to the board's attention if it hasn't already been brought up. Uh, the managed, all of our regulations um, go to the Attorney General's office for review to, to make sure, that, to ensure they pass legal muster. Um, and they send them back to us and occasionally we get questions and comments on a particular regulation and we did get what they call a tolling memo on the managed dove field um, regulation. Uh, they had some questions about how it could potentially impact normal agricultural operations. So we're working with staff to address those concerns with the Attorney General's office. And then when, when we get those addressed and send it back down, 
they have an additional 30 day review period to to have that so there's a concern that it that it may or may not make it onto the agenda for the for the April meeting because it's just because of the timing that they have the 30 day additional review period <laughs> so, so you back on that when's have we responded to that memo yet we are in the process of responding to it now okay. we received it late actually okay. so as expeditiously as possible yes thanks Randy all right so we're on to the Bureau of Wildlife Protection um, I have prepared a PowerPoint presentation on the duties of a game warden and my my PowerPoint skills are a little bit rusty, so we'll see how this goes. I reviewed it. I think you did an excellent job. <laughs> I haven't done one in a long time. How do we get the swing? Yep. Face bar. Duties of a game warden, or what will today bring? So what does it take? Uh, the Theodore Roosevelt once wrote, I want as game protectors men of courage, resolution, and hardihood who can handle the rifle, the ax, and paddle, who can camp out in summer or winter, who can go on snowshoes if necessary, who can go through the woods by day or night, without regards to trails. Like Roosevelt, we expect a lot of our wardens. We still expect them to have the skills of a woodsman and identify tracks, skulls, and birds in flight, but we also expect them to do PowerPoint presentations, write articulate criminal complaints, and use laptop computers in their mobile offices that we call the patrol car. They also willingly strap on their gun belts each day and head out the door to face a world which is becoming <coughs> ever more dangerous for law enforcement and the general public. Warden's duties are varied. Uh, game wardens administer a wide variety of game commission programs uh, within their assigned district of approximately 350 square miles. We have 136 warden districts in the state and while I don't want this statement to be uh, to sound arrogant or take away from the work of all of our employees, um, which is equally important, wardens are arguably the most visible employees of the agency and to much of the public, our wardens are the game commission. Approximately 30 of those 136 warden districts are without a warden right now, which places an additional workload on the remaining uh, wardens since the wildlife work in those vacant districts still needs attention. Anybody pick out our wardens in that photograph right there? Dirk Remensnyder is in the center of that picture. <laughs> Six foot ten, our tallest <laughs> warden right there. <laughs> Big bugger. Is he on a milk carton or what? He's, <laughs> on, he's on his knees. He's on his knees. <laughs> and, uh, and his long-term deputy, Barry Cooper, is in the, in the left-hand corner there. You can see his shoulder patch on. Um, so law enforcement is a primary responsibility um, with a focus on protecting our wildlife resources. Uh, our officers uh, prosecute approximately 7,500 wildlife crimes each year with greater than 95% successful prosecution rate. Increasingly, they are involved with crime codes prosecutions arising from commission operations. Law enforcement is not an October through December part of the job. Our salaried game wardens have full police authority for all of the Pennsylvania crimes code, but their primary enforcement efforts are spent protecting the wildlife resources of the Commonwealth. There are 1.5 million acres of state game lands to protect from abuse and wildlife crime takes place well outside the established hunting seasons. In addition to the 7,500 successful prosecutions each year, they also issue approximately 12,000 warnings each year for violations that could have resulted in a citation being issued. Whether performing routine administrative inspections or, and chatting with hunters in the fall or searching for evidence of a wildlife crime in the middle of the summer, the warden's law enforcement efforts continue all year long. Our wardens are highly trained and well equipped in order to investigate significant crimes against wildlife 
people, and property, including closed season violations, over the limit, hunting related shooting incidents, and property damage. From sofas and refrigerators to tires, washing machines, and shingles, illegal dumping is a huge problem on our state game land system and occurs year round due to the relative remoteness, the remoteness of these properties. Our wardens aggressively seek to recover evidence from these sites in order to identify and prosecute those who show such disregard for our treasured game land system. The penalties are $250 to $500 and $10 for each item deposited. I believe that's a photograph of the game lands up in the northwest part of the state. State game land abuses come in many forms, from illegal dumping, graffiti, theft of timber, plants, stone, and copper. Encroachment on state game land boundary lines continues to be an issue across the state and is often addressed by the local game wardens and land management officers in those areas. Game lands are increasingly being used for illegal drug activity, including the growing of marijuana, as well as the production of danger, dangerous, illicit drugs like methamphetamine. A recent example of this occurred on state game lands 291 in Warren County, when wardens uh, Rhonda Bimber and Matt Savinda were investigating a suspicious tent. The person occupying the tent fled on foot, and when run, run down and arrested by the wardens, was determined to be number two on Erie County's most wanted list. As a result of our wardens' investigation, Two persons were convicted of significant drug crimes and both will have to pay fines and spend four to five years in state prison. Enforcement, cooperation, and contacts. These are just uh, some of the uh, agencies uh, that, we, that our wardens deal with out there while they're enforcing the law. County District Attorney's Offices, Local and State Police, Fish and Boat Commission, DCNR, Forest and Park Rangers, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Office of the Attorney General, FBI, and ATF, and other state wildlife departments. Search and Rescue. Pennsylvania Game Warden Matt Savinda and Eric McBride recently helped locate a 91-year-old hunter who had become lost in the woods near State Game Lands 143 in Warren County. This is just one example of several lost or missing persons who were recovered by our Game Wardens this past fall. And sometimes it's not a search, but it's just a rescue. Again, um, while on law enforcement patrol in the fall, Warden Reed Miller and Southwest Regional Director Tom Fazy discovered a shed and a vehicle that were on fire. They busted a window and a window frame on the shed to extract a man who was trapped inside, likely saving his life. This is one more example of our wardens being at the right place and time to make a difference in a person's life. Our wardens spend many, <coughs> many hours each year on the road in their patrol vehicles and are often first or second on scene at significant traffic accidents and like events they are first aid and CPR trained and have the communications equipment and the presence of mind to render assistance and provide traffic control at these scenes. Also involved in information and education programs, whether it's sportsmen's clubs, uh, scout groups, hunter-trapper education, uh, media contacts and interviews, and attending fairs and community events. They are, our wardens routinely engage the public at events, large and small, in an effort to have our citizens connect with wildlife. Here is Southeast Region's Information and Education Supervisor Dustin Stoner interacting with some youngsters at a public event. In the photo at left, recently retired game warden Shane Hochlander is conducting an information and education program with a group of youngsters on fur bears. Uh, on the photo at right, Game Warden and Chief of our Administrative Division, Mike Reeder, is sharing his knowledge of winter tree identification at a recent Cabin Fever Sunday event held at Pennsylvania Game Commission headquarters. Our officers are out there assisting the public with wildlife conflicts as well, whether it's deer damage uh, to agricultural crops and orchards, bear complaints and damage, Canada geese, uh, nuisance beavers, 
and other issues related to mange, rabies, distemper, and increasingly chronic wasting disease. Beaver complaints are common in many parts of the state, but are particularly an issue in the northwestern Pennsylvania. Damage can include flooded properties and roadways caused by their dams, ornamental tree damage, and even trees falling on homes in some cases. <coughs> Our wardens do their best to mitigate damage to property while, while recognizing that beavers are a valuable natural resource which requires scientific management. Bear complaints can, relate, can be related to crops, trash, livestock, beehives, bird feeders, and barbecue grills. Bear complaints and trapping can take an enormous amount of time from a warden's day during the spring, summer, and fall in many areas of the state. In 2016, the wardens of the Northeast region responded to nearly 1,700 bear complaints. In this photograph, Warden Jerry Caprell and Deputy Warden Tad Page are processing a bear in the Northeast region. And as the slide says, sometimes we get the best of them, and sometimes they get the best of us. <laughs> Sick and injured wildlife. More uh, issues that our wardens are dealing with on a regular basis, whether it's mange, rabies, chronic wasting disease, injured wildlife from a variety of reasons, white nose syndrome, West Nile virus. Here's warden uh, Amanda Isaac responded to a report of an injured snowy owl at a prison in the South Central region on Christmas Day. Her involvement with the rescue and then getting the bird to a qualified wildlife rehabilitation center made a big splash on social media and is an example of the type of work our wardens do every day. Wildlife finds itself in all types of precarious situations, from ducklings down the storm drain to a deer inside a school or a business, and it's frequently our wardens who are called to respond. In the photo at left here, Game Warden Jay Cole uh, with wildlife rehabilitator Rob Robin Gerboski as they prepare to release an immature bald eagle that had been rehabilitated after being struck by a vehicle. The photo at right, Warden Mike Papinchak received a call about two antlered deer that had their antlers tangled up in netting around a batting cage on private property. Papinchak, who was assisted by a local police officer, was able to cut away the netting and the exhausted deer recovered and were able to walk away unharmed. Wildlife surveys, surveys and research. Whether it's turkey sighting surveys, woodcock surveys, trapping and transferring of wildlife, bear trapping, tagging and radio collaring, or monitoring of threatened and endangered species or species of special concern, our officers are often on the front lines gathering biological data that's required to make important decisions for wildlife management in the state. This is a photograph of turkey trapping and transfer that our wardens have uh, participated in over the years. For more on PA game wardens, um, anybody who wants to learn more about the daily duties can go to our website at pgc.pa.gov and click on the link uh, for Pennsylvania game wardens found on our homepage where we have a 10 minute video that's recently been put out there by our information and education bureau that shows some of the, some of the varied duties that our officers are, are involved with. The name change. Our officers were for many years known as district game protectors. And 30 years ago, the title was changed to wildlife conservation officer. The change to state game warden was made to clarify to the public who we are and what we do. Even though the Pennsylvania Game Commission has had a presence in this Commonwealth for over 220 years, it was amazing to see how many citizens didn't recognize our officers for what they were, game wardens. We developed a new graphics package for the patrol vehicle, which also reflects the name change. The graphics package was designed and is being installed by a local company who won the bid and looks more professional and is more identifiable than our old vehicle markings that were installed in-house. While only a few of the newly marked vehicles have made it to the field, Anecdotal reports of feedback from the public has been positive. One of our wardens in the Northeast region was stopped by the public three times in the same day to comment on how much they liked the vehicle markings. 
New uniform shoulder patches and badges will be made as well as new business cards for the wardens. The timing of the change is such that our inventory of uniform patches and badges were low and an order would have been uh, needed to be placed in the near future regardless of the name change. Business cards are being replaced as the wardens run out of their, of their old business cards. So that is the, uh, that is the end of my duties of a game warden PowerPoint presentation. So if there are any questions on that, I'm also going to, to touch on the regulations that are, that are coming up for final adoption at the, uh, at the April commission meeting. But if there are any questions on, the, on this part of the presentation, I'd be glad to answer them. Uh, for, I just want to say that was a great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Did a good job. And for not doing a PowerPoint for a long time, you did okay. <laughs> maybe maybe some more graphics next time or something. But. So like with the, with the change of with the change of patches and it, so when we change the patches, we're not changing uniforms, right? The uniforms are going to just all they're going to do is take the old patches off with the new patches on. That's correct. Badges are going to change. How are they going to do that? How are they bringing the badges in? And, and is there a time frame? Do we have a drop dead date to when we're going to be WCO to to game work? We don't have a. I mean, the name change took place on at the beginning of the year, January 1st. Yeah, no, I get that, the, but I mean, as far as all of our... Yeah, we still are working with vendors to develop um, some of the patches and, and the badges, so we don't have... we don't. That's out of our, our control, the timing of that. So we don't have a firm drop dead date, but we want to get it rolled out as soon as we possibly can. I, I saw a prototype of the new patches. They're pretty stinking nice. The, the green, like the olive yeah, green. I like that. I love just the patch. I mean, the way the patch is shaped and what's on it and yeah. the color of it, they look really nice. So I think we're doing a really good job at, at the transition. I appreciate all the work that everybody's put into it. Any other questions for Randy as far as duties of a, of a game warden? All right. Very good. And this is just a, a summation of the regulations that are coming up for final adoption here at the April meeting. Um, just as a refresher, a reminder, the change in the dove hunting hours start time for the first season. As you may recall, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has given us additional dove hunting days because we do not have Sunday hunting in Pennsylvania, which is going to extend the length of that first season. Um, by regulation, we've always started dove hunting in that first season at noontime. But the change that we're proposing here is starting dove hunting as the same as any other migratory bird hunting hours, which would be half an hour before sunrise. That's the first uh, proposed change, that, and that was preliminarily passed at the January meeting. Um, authorize the use of semi-automatic shotguns for deer, bear, and elk statewide. That was passed at January preliminarily. As you're aware, we've been using semi-automatic shotguns for hunting white-tailed deer in, special re in the highly populated special regulations areas for a long time um, with no significant issues to report. So this is just an extension of the semi-automatic allowance on a statewide basis. Is no shell limit, Randy, or is it? No, there will be no, no shell limit. Did we correct the 12-gauge um, the, the and the 20-gauge? Uh, there were some issues with the regulation in the beginning. Where it was 12 gauge only. I'll have to take a look at that. I'm I'm not sure that, that I recall what that particular issue was. The 12 and the 20 gauge I was that. It was a 12 gauge. I think we had it listed as 12 gauge only. There's some really popular 20 gauge. There is our existing regs in, in uh, special regulations areas. Um, they do ha they do mention something about 12 gauge and 20 gauge one. Uh, one uh, allowance for um, for buckshot, I think. So I'll have to take a look at that and make I sure that we have was, that. I thought this was in the new in the new regs for the state where we elim we didn't add the 20 gauge. And then are we interested or even contemplate? I know it was for elk. I think it was in the old that right? Was, yeah, I'll have okay. to check. Yeah, um, but we should take a look at that because there's some even some 410 slugs out there that are very accurate that a youth could use mm -hmm. uh, for deer um, if we're talking about trying to bring a semi-automatic opportunity in. Right. I think we, there might have been a minimum for elk. That's 12 gauge, I believe. Yeah. Okay. But is that necessary for elk? I mean, that, you know, 20, the, the, <laughs> this, 
you know, the statistics on or specifics on the 20 gauge are pretty, pretty good. So let me take a look at it. Okay. Uh, next on the list is eliminating the permit requirement to use uh, to use bait to attract deer for hunting in the southeast special regulations areas. This is this does not eliminate the 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 allowance to use bait. What it eliminates is the permit that is required to do so, and that was that was passed preliminarily at the January meeting. Uh, changes to the pheasant permit, including the free youth pheasant permit. Um, and also, in addition to that, there was there's a change that was preliminarily passed in January regarding allowing people on their own private property who purchase their own pheasants um, to, uh, use, to hunt those, release and hunt those without having um, the need for the the pheasant permit was that was that personal private property or was that was it specific to hunting clubs it's private property that is not um, signed up in a game commission cooperative access program so it would not be limited at this point to well, if somebody who owned club. a piece of land and had it was not open to public could put pheasants out and hunt them without a permit Correct. Okay. As long as they were lawfully acquired, had the appropriate right. paperwork, et cetera. Yes. Is, is there any re, is there any specifications in there for uh, contiguous properties to the game lands or cooperative where we're stocking so that we don't get our birds flying over to say a guy puts out two birds on a neighboring property and says, "Well, I'm hunting my birds." No, there's nothing in the current in the regulation currently that that uh, addresses How are we gonna address that? adjacent properties. Um, they are going to be, uh, currently, as the regulations are written, they will be able to release birds on their properties and birds that escape from the game lands potentially could become their targets as well and they would not be required to have the pheasant permit. They would have to release pheasants. Correct, they, they would have to release their own, them. right. They couldn't They couldn't just yeah, hunt the border. Said, you could, I, you could at least one bird and go, oh yeah. Yeah, I we can't control where the, the birds go. Mm -hmm. Right. Now what actual impact that would have? Unless the birds are on private land. Yeah. Well, not unless you get permission, but I mean, uh, have we opened the can of worms? Or, um, I don't know. Yeah, and and we've spoken about the 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 uh, managed dove fields here this morning, and the reason I have the asterisk there next to that one is because I wanted, to, as a reminder, to inform the board of the tolling memo that we received. And then finally is the fall restraint device on state game lands, which we're all aware was tabled at the January meeting. So those are the regulations um, that we're looking at here for the April meeting. And uh, that's, that would be it for the presentation, unless there's any additional questions. Any other questions for Randy at this point? Very good. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your time. You're welcome. And on cue, look who walks through the door. <laughs> you must have been watching on your computer. I was actually back there. Oh, were you? Yes, I was. I can't see through Brian, so. Uh, it's easy to hide behind Rich. <laughs> <laughs> you're tall. That's what I'm saying. You're just tall. <laughs> <laughs> So this is Bureau of Information Education. Yes, sir. Steve, you're going to be talking about uh, the tree stand safety campaign. That's right. I want to follow up with uh, the tree stand safety proposed reg, and I was also asked to give a presentation on the Bureau and talk about some of our divisions and projects that we work on, so I'll, I'll go through that uh, briefly, knowing that I'm standing between you and lunch. So I'll try to make it brief. All good. Okay, as was mentioned, um, there's a proposal before the board to consider a regulation which would require anyone who hunts on game lands from an elevated platform to wear a safety harness. And this was in response to the uh, presentation that was put on at the December working group meeting in which we had Dr. Smith from Geisinger Medical present the results <coughs> of a study that he's been doing for several decades now that look at uh, falls on off of a 
tree stands and uh, incidences in which individuals receive medical care. Uh, regardless of how the board um, moves forward with that proposal, uh, we, we've been challenged um, by Commissioner Daly to take a look at what we can do from the Bureau standpoint to increase our educational uh, campaigns and awareness of this issue. So we're going to be uh, rolling that out over several levels into the summer and fall months. Um, primarily, and I guess the face of that campaign will be the, the logo that you see in front of you now. Uh, we worked with a graphic design designer on creating this image that really succinctly gets the message across the need to wear a harness. Um, this is going to be something that will be showing up on our, any printed materials that we provide on social media as well. What we also like to do is, is we're going to be getting this on signs and we're going to be working with the regions on having it in game lands parking lots. We're also going to identify the areas where we know we have a high volume of archery permits sold and we're going to work on uh, getting it in billboards within those areas. So we're really going to just try to the blanket the state and our licensed buyers with this educational campaign, reminding them of the importance of the need to wear a harness when they're hunting. So again, this will be regardless of what the board does with that proposed regulation, we're going to be increasing our efforts of, of making it an issue for our archery hunters. So are there any questions on this before I move forward? You said archery hunters, what about rifle hunters? Uh, of course, rifle hunters as well, but we know from the, uh, just our survey anecdotally as well that the vast majority of the time, and I think uh, Dr. Smith indicated what he's seeing in his uh, practice and his survey is it is archery hunters. That's where it's taking place. And we know that what he also showed is that the, the number of incidences is increasing and it's increasing at a rate uh, that corresponds with the increase in archery hunters as well. So the vast majority of the times when someone's going up from the elevated platform, they are uh, using archery tackle and that's why we're focusing it on them. But certainly we won't uh, differentiate in any uh, you know, press releases that we put out any stories and game news. So. Any other questions? I'll dive into this presentation then. Um, part of the, probably the most difficult part of this, preparing for this presentation was getting our, the staff to allow me to take their picture. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, it all begins out front for us. This is the staff that handles the sale of merchandise. They handle our print, the prints, patches, and books. Um, online orders as they come in. They answer the phones, uh, orders through there as well as in addition to just the sheer volume of calls that come in on a daily basis asking questions. Uh, they also sell licenses. Um, in, a, in a few weeks when licenses go on sale, there will be a line out the door uh, during the peak hours of the day as individuals come in um, in that first week buying their licenses. So with all due respect to every other employee in the Game Commission, I honestly think uh, this our front staff are uh, just some of the busiest and hardest workers that we have. They, they do an incredible job. Um, they also staff our, our shows, uh, such as farm show, outdoor show, and do uh, thousands of dollars of sales there at, at each of those. And they're happy. Look how happy they are. <laughs> <coughs> our publications division uh, is headed up by our communications director, Travis Lau. Uh, Travis responds to all the media inquiries as they come in, be it through TV, radio or print. Um, the difficult aspect of Travis's job is often not a lot of warning. It's just a, hey, we got, uh, you know, we want to run a story tonight at six o'clock. Can you be prepared to answer some questions? Or um, an individual might call up and say, hey, I have an article that's going to run, you know, in Sunday's paper. Not that Bob Fry would ever do that. I just want to clarify, but <laughs> individuals who work on a short deadline and don't provide, provide notice, uh, but Travis on a moment's notice has to be prepared to articulate our message um, and he does a, does a great job with that. Uh, another aspect of his job is, is news releases. Um, Travis uh, handles the bulk of them in addition to his staff, uh, Bob D'Angelo and Joe Kozak. They put out about almost 100 a year, so you're looking at roughly two a week. A lot of work that goes into news releases, um, making sure that we have we coordinate the story with the region that was involved or the different bureau that was involved or in some instances such as with CWD we look at other agencies that are involved to make sure we get this, the facts accurate, this, um, that everything's correct and also look for quotes 
and then uh, run it by the executive offal and, and get their approval and then put it out. So there's a lot of work that goes into a news release. Um, you know, so to do about two a week, it, it takes up a good bit of his time. We also will provide support to the regions. If an IES wants to send a news release out, Travis and his staff are always available um, there to, to provide editorial comments and suggestions and work with them on articulating the message. They also handle the Hunter Trapper Digest, uh, which, um, you know, regardless of how many we issue, it's still a, a lot of work to make sure that the content in there is accurate. Now there is uh, Game News, of course, our flagship publication. Uh, we have about 40,000 paid subscribers. Um, and according to uh, Dot's presentation, I think we can expect a few more from the Auditor General's office in the near future as well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know for sure if that was the whole purpose of the audit, was just to get three years worth of Game News, but <laughs> it was probably a factor. Um, so we have Game News, about 40,000 paid subscribers, and another 40,000 roughly are provided free. We provide them to our volunteers, to our deputies, uh, to our uh, private, uh, private landowners who are in our co-op prog program. We also provide some to school libraries. And I don't think we can ever truly measure just the impact of game news um, and how many people it has reached to, to inform about the agency and about wildlife conservation. Uh, you saw we had our cadet class here. I spoke to them a few days ago. And it was a young, it's a young group, you know, early 20s, a lot of them. And I asked them how many are familiar with game news. And of course, every hand went up. So it still has an, has an incredible reach. Um, Travis serves as the senior editor, uh, but gets a lot of support from his staff. Bob D'Angelo uh, authors a lot of articles as well as editing the ones that's come in, um, as does Joe Kosak. A lot of Joe's articles provide a historical context, look at what the agency has done in the past, lessons that we've learned. Uh, those are very popular as well. Uh, Travis also, from his shop, handles the wildlife calendar. Joe takes a lot of that work, preparing that every year. Um, then we have the big game scoring uh, program. Uh, Bob D'Angelo is a certified Boone and Crockett scorer, so gets high volume of requests, especially this time of the year. Now the drying uh, period for, has passed for individuals who want to have their, uh, their racks scored. Uh, compiles all the statistics and publishes a big game records book every year. Our media services division, headed by Lori Neely Mitchell, um, big program within this division is our social media pages uh, that is run primarily by Brittany Howe. We maintain a Twitter feed, an Instagram account, and a, a Facebook page as well. And just to talk about Facebook for a second, this is something that we put a lot of focus on in the past couple of years um, for a lot of reasons. One of which is it provides really our only avenue of reaching the non-hunters. Um, and we do know for a fact that a lot of them follow our page. So this is an opportunity for us to show the non-hunters what, what exactly the Game Commission does and create a favorable impression for them right off the bat. And also we like to show our hunters. We want to show them uh, the focus is on what it is that we're doing so that they can see firsthand where their license dollars go to. So here's a couple of examples of posts that just took place uh, within the past two or three weeks. Um, in order to run the, the Facebook page the way we want to, we really rely on the regions to send us content so that they can show us what's happening out in the field because we would never know about it here in Harrisburg. And here's an instance in which, I believe it was from the Northeast, uh, a game warden was called to the Susquehanna River. Two bald eagles uh, had apparently been fighting up above and ended up in the river. And because the river was so cold, uh, their muscles essentially froze and they were locked together in what would have been a death grip. An individual called into a game warden. Game warden came to the scene rescued the eagles, took them to a, a wildlife rehabilitator. I probably can't see in the bottom there, but this post was seen by almost a half a million people. Wow. It was also picked up by news outlets um, in Philly, Pittsburgh, and everywhere in between, and it even made it to the national media as well. Um, here's another instance. Uh, this one just came to us the other week from uh, Mike Steingraver in the North Central. A game warden was called to rescue an orphaned cub that was Game Warden Mark Fair in Potter County. We provided it to Mark Turnett. Mark Turnett, during his bear research, provided the cub to a, a sow that already had two, uh, two cubs of her own. And from all appearances, that mother just adopted that orphan cub into her den. Um, this is just a terrific example of, of working together to save that animal. This, uh, Mike Steingraver was able to cr create a video of it. We put it on our Facebook page. It's been seen by almost 200,000 people. And in addition, this also has been picked up by a variety of news outlets as well. 
So these are just two ex examples uh, from the past two or three weeks. Um, we do a lot throughout the year that are seasonal. We'll look at habitat work that's taking place on the game lands. In the next couple of weeks, we'll, we'll show some prescribed fires as well. And we're also always trying to get um, content about any research projects that are happening. Again, we want to show hunters where their licensed dollars go and let our non-hunters get an appreciation for the Game Commission. We've also been conducting Facebook Live videos, uh, which is exactly as it, as it sounds. It's a live video going through our Facebook page. Uh, we've been, so there's, a, there's always a risk when you're doing a live video, but we've been able to do these pretty successfully. Uh, we conducted one of a big game scoring of a rack um, that received over a million views. So these, these are turning out to be quite popular. We also did one just recently in which uh, for the announcement of DMA4, in which we talked about uh, the creation of that area and what kind of implication it would have for our hunters. So it's another way we're using that platform to communicate. And we're not just communicating you know, for communication's sake. There's also tangible benefits that we receive from our social media efforts. And I'll just touch on a few of them. Uh, there's been instances in which we've used the page to ask for any tips regarding uh, poaching, un unlawful taking of wildlife. Here's one from the North Central. We put on a picture of, an, of a bear that had been illegally harvested, asked for anyone who knew about it to contact us. And if I recall this, this story correctly, it was seen by several hundred thousand people, shared multiple times, and the individual actually called in himself because he felt the pressure that was being generated by this post and called in and said, I did it. Um, another instance, very similar from the South Central, Bert, our IES there, uh, contacted Lori on a Saturday evening to say uh, the game warden had been assaulted in a vehicle. Uh, Lori got it on Facebook um, that evening, was seen by almost a quarter million people, and uh, the tips just came in right off the bat and led right to the individual who was involved and uh, that led to a successful prosecution. We also had one this fall, somebody, uh, an, op an officer sent in a video of an individual dumping a deer carcass, an illegal deer carcass, in the back of an elementary school. We put it on our Facebook page and it led right to the individual who was involved. So from time to time we're able to use, to, <coughs> to leverage that <coughs> viewers that we have on our Facebook page um, in uh, law enforcement uh, for, um, capabilities as well. Um, other duties of the division include maintaining the, electric, uh, the electronic digest, which is done through Nextbook. Uh, they also create the pocket guide that goes out to all licensed buyers uh, that has the seasons and bag limits. Uh, of course, maintaining our, our website and any updates that need to be done there, as well as keeping all the pages live and, and seasonal based on the time of the year. Also, webinars. Are, uh, we've been uh, for about a year and a half now, maybe even a little longer, conducting um, a month long or a monthly webinar series, in which we look at different programs within the agency and try to get them out to a, to a new audience through this. Um, we then record the webinars and put them on our YouTube channel. Uh, these are quite popular. Um, our, our most popular one was just done recently in which we looked at upgrades to the mapping system. We had a full complement there to watch that and then it's been viewed many times on our, on our YouTube channel. We also did one recently on grouse that received a lot of good comments. The division also provides the auditorium AV support, including recording this meeting right now. Uh, another project we're involved in is the L camera up in the North Central. Um, this has been going for two years now. I, th I guess this, third, this fall will be potentially the third, in which we uh, stream a, a field on game lands and let um, people who, many of whom never would have made that trip up to Benazette, give them an opportunity to view the L camera. Um, and as you can see from the bottom left picture, um, this project and a lot of other projects just require intense supervision, and that's what I like to bring to the table. Um, the Hanover Eagle Cam is another project. This is once it's been viewed, what now, for four years, five years? Four years, millions of people, literally millions of people have, have watched this. Um, and with drama that no one could have predicted this year in which one of the nesting female, or the nesting female from the nesting pair has been driven off, killed is, is uh, suspected, and an intruder female not only um, ate the eggs but is now trying to take over the nest for herself. So it remains to be seen whether or not the male will um, mate with her and if she can establish a nesting, a nest of her own. So. Certainly a story that nobody would have predicted, but 
that's uh, nature in its rawest form, and we're providing this, con this free for millions of people. And just the amount of comments that this generates, the amount of people that, that uh, write in is, is astounding. And it's, we have analytics showing it's been viewed in every, count, every country. So that's a big program. We also produce uh, documents from time to time, such as uh, brochures. There's one on deputies recruitment, a cookbook, wildlife notes, and even the business cards, make sure they're up to date. Uh, this division also uh, produces full length reports, such as the habitat report, annual reports for the past couple of years, as well as uh, photography needs for the, the Bureau as well. There's Al Korber, able to get close to animals like that on a regular basis. No one knows for sure how he does it. Where do you keep, where do you keep that mount at? Where's that? Um, Tracy Graziano is our videographer. Uh, we've done a lot of videos on a variety of subjects. Uh, 30 years bald eagle restoration. Did one recently this fall on chronic wasting disease. I looked at game wardens beyond the season. As, as uh, Randy mentioned, taking a look at all of their duties outside of just the hunting seasons. Uh, try to show research when we can. Here's the fawn predator study. Also, when we uh, reached the 1.5 million acre um, mark for game lands, we did a video showing all the habitat work that takes place on the game lands, providing that history. And then uh, one recently on grouse and the impact of the West Nile virus. Um, this has been viewed thousands of times and really provided for our hunters, our grouse hunters, an understanding of what's going on. Um, and this received national recognition as well um, for, for the work that was done there. Um, another project that we've been running out of this division recently is our uh, different uh, photograph contests. Um, we, in the summer months, we run a trail camera contest showing that there are no buck in Pennsylvania. Um, we also provide a Beyond the Harvest contest that shows, again, realizing we have non-hunters on our page, we want them to see it's not just about the kill, but that, you know, here's the memories of field for hunting. Harvest photos. Uh, this is the winner from this past year. Was, this was a, actually a, bu a public land buck in McKean County um, that was harvested. And it was interesting seeing the comments on our Facebook page as we ran this contest. Um, a couple individuals from, I believe it was North Carolina, started commenting our, on our page, tagging each other, saying, are you seeing these bucks that Pennsylvania is producing? We should go hunt there. Somebody else chimed in, yeah, I have an uncle who goes there. And next thing we knew, they had scheduled a hunt for this fall. So uh, people all across the country are seeing what we're producing and uh, are realizing that, that the quality of the management that's been done to produce these type of animals. Um, and then the winner from the contest came to us at the uh, outdoor show, and we were able to, to measure her rack there with her live and present her with a trail cam for winning that contest. And we're, we also take a lot of these stories as they come to us through the contest and um, use them for, for game news articles as well. So it's, it's a really a gift that just keeps giving. We're getting a ton of content. I think the most recent game news had, had a few pictures as well. And we've done one for Turkey as well. And we did a junior turkey hunt uh, contest. And no, Brian, I'm not going to tell you where that picture came in from. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, so this is Commissioner Hoover could learn if you pull the trigger. That's, it actually <laughs> get, that's the picture that you get. Having been with you on that hunt, I'm not going to comment. <laughs> <laughs> wait, but you didn't pull the trigger either. I, 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 <laughs> he was close. <laughs> And then our research and education division. Um, two components of this. First would be our research, uh, headed by Dr. Corin Jagnow, who's really recognized as an expert in the field of human dimensions on the methods for collecting surveys of our licensed buyers. Uh, a lot of what Dr. Rosenberry talked about, as he, he commented, you know, people will say, well, I wasn't asked about the survey, so the opinion can't be valid. Of course, that's not scientific. We have, there's a, there's a way of, of gauging our licensed buyers, their input getting their input and finding out their opinions on a variety of topics. Sometimes it can be just general topics, motivation for hunting, satisfaction. Um, but we can drill down into specifics as well. Um, just recently, I believe it was last year, asking support on use of semi-autos for, for big game. 
so we can uh, get as specific as, as we want to on, on topics. We also, uh, Dr. Jagner will use focus groups. It's a um, good way to test messages with a variety of people. Uh, there's been several done recently. We look at focus groups with female hunters, with active hunters, with lapsed hunters. Uh, we've measured marketing campaigns. We've found ways we can improve our messaging. So all of these tools uh, from the research side are just a, a way to get the best social science that we can and, and inform our, our decisions and also uh, you know, provide that science to the board as you guys make decisions moving forward too. And come to our Hunter Trapper Education Program. Uh, we administer this program here within the Bureau and provide support to the regions, make sure that they have the materials that they need as they conduct classes. We coordinate scheduling of the classes. Um, we uh, maintain a database of our students. Um, we make any changements, changes to the curriculum as needed and updates. And we also administer an online class. We have a basic online class for, for those 16 and older, and we provide some advanced curriculums through an online as well. Our, our program is second only to Texas in students run per year. Um, and that we'll have about 35,000 going through this uh, each year. Uh, our Hunter edu Trapper Education Program is funded through a grant from Pittman Robertson money. It comes out to about 2.1 million per year. Uh, the bulk of that goes to our Hunter Education Program, but we also have money that is earmarked from the feds that must be sp spent on shooting sports. Um, so we've been using that to, in a variety of ways, just this past year, we used it to fully fund the creation of an archery range on a game lands in Montgomery County, I believe. It's fully funded through that segment of the PR grant. We're looking into potentially expanding that and um, finding some other regions that could have an archery range as well. Uh, this program is run by Todd Holmes, the shooting sports coordinator. And the big uh, part of his job, though, is, is running our NAS program, National Archery's in the School. We're up to about 250, over 250 schools that have this program in them as part of the, their uh, PE curriculum. And just this month, we ran a tournament at State College, which about 800 students attended. Um, we're able to shoot all day. We started, we started around 8.30 in the morning, and uh, just in different waves, they kept shooting throughout the day, ended about 5 o'clock at night, uh, provided when it was all said and done, team awards as well as uh, individual awards for the best shooters who were there. So that's a basic summary of, of what INE does, what, we, what we've been doing for the past couple of years. We've maintained a pretty uh, consistent level of staffing. Um, however, thanks to Director Burhans, we're going to finally be able to expand a little bit and move into some new programs that I'm pretty excited about. Uh, we just recently hired an R3 coordinator who will be carrying on our junior pheasant hunts and youth field day programs as well as looking into additional programs within that vein that would in, um, potentially attract new hunters and retain the ones we do have. We also are going to be hiring a CWD communications specialist whose job will be to be the liaison between i &E and uh, wildlife management and the different regions as well and also Wayne and try to make sure that we're all on the same message getting um, when we articulate our message to the public on CWD and also to just increase the volume of, of messaging that we do uh, related to CWD. And then uh, we're also going to be hiring a communication specialist within our research and education division who's going to be funded from our PR grant and is going to be uh, able to use Pittman Robertson money to talk about communication projects that were done, funded through Pittman Roberts money, which is a lot of our habitat programs. So those are three areas that we're going to be expanding into here in the new future, in the near future. But um, as, of, as of now, that's where we are. And just really a talented group of individuals that, that we're privileged to have, have working for us. And they do a great job on behalf of the agency. So, that's all I have. Any questions for Steve? I knew it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> hey. A couple things, Steve. Sure. Um, so some of these videos, you know, I've gone out and watched uh, all the, the YouTube videos, and they're, they're very good. I guess I'm curious, have we ever thought about putting, maybe in the last 10 seconds or whatever, 
as a non-hunter, how can I contribute to the PA Game Commission and try to get some dollars flowing into our agency? A lot of those viewers are not hunters. They're not contributing to this agency, but yet they're interested in eagles, they're interested in all, whatever it happens to be. I guess I'd like to see if we could put, you know, just a little brief thing at the end, you know, how to, how to throw some money on the bank, right? Um, I guess the other thing I wanted to ask about is, and you and I have talked about how to better integrate what your staff is doing with, you know, the regions and our IESs and, uh, you know, especially along the, because none of what you mentioned here is like the, lia the legislative liaison work that we're now pushing out to the IESs. So it seems like there's, like, you know, we've, we've got this, this central pod and then we got this, this orbiting group of people and sometimes they never quite seem to be meeting. And uh, just wondering how we, you know, do coordinate all those efforts so it's a, it's a leveraged effort, you know, instead of just different people doing different things. Sure, and I, I think that's something that we constantly struggle with as far as improving. And I, I know we do. Um, we rely on the regions a lot, like I said. We will work with them on news releases, um, especially when it comes to our social media, when it comes to our Facebook page. We ask them, you know, we need your content from you. So we've developed a great relationship in those regards. Uh, we can't m do our job without getting the content that comes in from them. And a sort, of course, also I would say for our hunter trapper education program as well. It, we need the, the regional support there. So it's a, it's a, we have a lot of moving parts, as, as you alluded to, and they all depend on maintaining communications with, our, with the regions. Can we do a better job at it? More of it? Absolutely. I think it's an area that we're always going to be trying to improve on. But I'm pretty happy with what we have now. Um, I, I look at what we got on our Facebook page just recently from Michael Steingraber in the, in the North Central. Um, he's one who just came on, and him and I have talked, and he said, I'm excited to work with you. So we're always going to be working on it, always going to try to improve it. But, you know, we do have such a the grassroots, the support there, you know, the boots on the ground, the region. We need that communication with them. It needs to be open an open line. I just want to re-mention re about um, Mr. Steingraber's work. It was really some cutting-edge stuff where he actually, if you actually would have played that video, I wish we would have brought a copy of it. But he did a, basically a news release, a, a video news release that he developed on his own using equipment that they have. And I think that's some of the cutting-edge stuff that we're trying to try out now. Um, and it, he did a great job on that. It was, and actually, he's a new information education supervisor. He came down to Harrisburg shortly after he was hired and laid out his vision to staff on what he thought he could bring to the table. And I'll tell you what, I'm really excited with some of the vision uh, that him and, and the other information education supervisors, I think we're just tapping the surface, but we're moving along well. Yeah, it's funny you say tapping the surface, because if you think about this agency, you brought it up in your testament. I mean, you know, we've got like 600 and whatever employees, but then all of the various volunteers, and it's almost like you, know, you need to trickle messages down that yeah. every one of them can push out. Exactly. exactly. And that's one thing we just need to keep trying to focus yep, on. Exactly. And getting money from the non hunters, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I think along Jim's lines, we all recognize that communications has been a struggle with this agency. We spent, I don't know how many hours yesterday talking to, talking to some of our partners about how we can get the message out about the deer management plan and what we're doing as far as deer. And, you know, even sitting around the table with them, they're all struggling. They're all, they all come from, um, you know, private organizations who are, who are having the same problem we are, getting the word out. And what do they do and what's the best way to hit, you know, your constituents specifically. So we're all struggle with that. But as far as your presentation today, I want to thank you because I think that's the best presentation we've gotten from I&E in years. And I, just to see what you do and what, what all is tied into what you do, I appreciate that. And, and recognizing that whatever we can do to help you out, I mean, we're certainly – I think all of us will say that communication is the number one thing that we want to work on as an agency. So thanks for that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. Is there anything else? Any other questions for Steve? All right. I think we're going to adjourn the working group meeting. We're going to go into executive session upstairs. Um, we'll come back here. So there's discussion around one. Discussion around one. Briefing papers. So briefing papers. Discussion, discussion around one. Yep. So we'll be back here at 1 o'clock. Thank you. Stop it. We do a lot of stuff, don't we? Yeah. <laughs>